Tonight we're starting a new series. It's called The Spiritual Life. So I want you to pay attention for the next eight weeks. The most important decision in anyone's life is to come to faith in Yeshua. Do you agree with that? Amen. You must repent, believe, and receive Yeshua as your Messiah, your Lord, your Savior. To be saved, to be born again, to receive the gift of eternal life, and to receive the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. That's the first most important decision in anyone's life, in everyone's life. The second most important decision in the believer's life is to live for Messiah. You can call it sanctification, you can call it maturity, or just plain spirituality. But what we shall endeavor to do in the next few months in our services here at Beth Yeshua is to learn about and grow in our spiritual life. And that's the title of the message in the whole series is the spiritual life. After becoming born again, our spiritual lives are the most important aspects of our lives. By faith we are saved, and by this same faith we are to live out the rest of our lives. This decision is the most important for believers, more important than who you are going to marry, more important than where are you going to live, more important about how are you going to make money. We all must be growing in our spiritual lives each and every day. Eternity is counting on it. Not our position in eternity, but the rewards we shall earn in eternity. First of all, let us specifically define what we're talking about when we mention the spiritual life. Dr. Charles Ryrie is an excellent theologian. He states this, spirituality is the grown-up relationship to the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. It's the grown-up relationship to God. So the idea of every believer is to become grown-up in our spiritual relationship with the Lord. The spiritual life is a life that produces a spiritual believer. And do we not all want to be spiritual believers? Amen? Yes, we do. Three factors important for the spiritual life. As we're doing just an introductory sermon tonight, we're going to be getting into a lot of scriptures, not only tonight, but for the rest of these eight weeks or so. Three factors important for the spiritual life. Number one is regeneration. This term means to be born again, to have salvation. You must be saved to actually have a spiritual life. One must be regenerated or born again to have the spiritual life God wants us to have. A whole lot of people in this world, they can have spiritual life, but you know what? It's not the right spiritual life. They're dealing with demons, unfortunately. Non-believers cannot have the spiritual life since they are not regenerated. Non-believers can certainly fake being spiritual, but the absence of the real Kodesh eventually reveals their non-spirituality. The second factor important for the spiritual life is the Ruach Kodesh. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to live the spiritual life. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit is the one that empowers us to live the spiritual life. We certainly cannot do it on our own. We need God to help us. And he helps us in five different ways. Number one, he teaches us spiritual truths. It's in John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, if you take taking notes. He teaches us spiritual truths. Number two, he guides us. Romans chapter 8, 14. Holy Spirit, he guides us in our lives each and every day. We just need to listen and obey. Number three, he gives us assurance of our salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Sometimes we have doubts about whether we're saved or not at times, especially for new believers, right? I know I went through that when I was a new believer. Every new believer does. But the Holy Spirit assures us that we are saved. Number four, he prays for us in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 27. 
The Holy Spirit prays for us in ways that we can't even understand. Number five, he gives us spiritual gifts for the growth of the body of Messiah. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 7. And so the idea with the royal Kodesh is that we need to be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Yielded to the Holy Spirit to be spiritual. We have to be yielded. The third factor here. Time. Time. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear about this, but time. It takes time to become spiritual. Just as physical development takes time, spiritual development takes time as well. No one is spiritual the moment they are saved. They can be spirit-filled at salvation, but they are not spiritual. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 states this, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. A spiritual believer does the appraising, or that word means discerning. And they discern all situations in life, but they themselves are not appraised by other folks, for it's not necessary. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 states this, we have it up on the screen as well. Brother, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. So the spiritual person helps weaker believers to repent, to confess their sin, and be forgiven, so that they can be restored back to fellowship with the Lord and with the congregation. That's the whole idea when it comes to congregational discipline. The idea is to restore people back to the Lord. Not to kick them out, but to restore. Now that doesn't mean people don't deserve to be kicked out in the end, but there's a process involved, and it's a restoration process. The spiritual ones, they do it in love, gentleness, and patience. That's a sign of being spiritual. Many, many years ago, Pastor Cooper and I, we met with uh, a lady of this congregation. We're looking at maybe 15, 13 years or so. We had to address a situation in her life of the dreaded word that starts with G. Gossiping. Gossiping is a horrible thing that happens in congregations. And so we talked with her about the gossiping that she was doing, and we did it in love, gentleness, and patience. Remember that meeting, Rich? And unfortunately, in that meeting, that person blew up at us. We were in a public place. Scream and yell at us in public. And both Richard Cooper and I, we sat there, and we took it. She got up, and then she left. She left that public place, and you know what? I was the one that drove her there. <laughs> she called somebody else to drive her back home. That's how upset she was. But the idea is that we as spiritual people, as mature believers, and as the leaders of the congregation, we did it in love and joy and peace with her, and with great patience. We took about a half an hour to get to the subject. We shoosed with her for 30 minutes before we even talked. That's because we were not very happy about what we had to do. But as the spiritual leaders, we were helping that weaker believer to repent, confess, and forgive. And you know what? In time, she did. Unfortunately, it took about 10 years. But in any event, the key concept of spirituality is the one word, maturity. Maturity is the key concept in spirituality. Just as physical development needs maturity, so too spiritual development needs maturity as well. All of us were physically born and in time became mature adults. By the same token, all of us were born again as spiritual babes or spiritually immature, and in time have become or will become mature spiritual believers. 
Some believers never grow into maturity, but the goal for all believers is to become mature. You want to write that down? The goal of all believers is to become mature believers. There are six ramifications of maturity or the spiritual life. Number one ramification, new believers. New believers cannot be called mature because they have not had enough time to grow and develop in spiritual knowledge and experience. So time is important. Knowledge and experience are important as well. A new believer can be spirit-filled, but cannot be spiritually mature, because that takes time. Number two, ramification of the spiritual life, maturity. An older believer may not be spiritually mature, because although they had the time to mature, they lack the raw kodeshes controlling them, the yielding to the Holy Spirit. So the new believer may be spirit-filled, but lacking the time to be mature. The older believer has had the time to be mature, but may not be spirit-filled, because they lack the yielding to the Ruach Kodesh. Maturity needs time and yieldedness to the Ruach Kodesh. Yieldedness means to allow the Ruach Kodesh, of the Holy Spirit, to control you. You yield yourself over to the Holy Spirit. That means He controls you. Now this can be one of the hardest things to do for believers because guess who likes to be in control? We do. Yes. Just raise your hand. I do. And that is the issue, right? That's the number one problem in the believer's life. Who's got control over the Holy Spirit or you? Or someone else? Now the third ramification of the spiritual life is backsliding. A mature believer can backslide in certain areas in their spiritual life and yet not lose all the ground that they have gained in other areas of their maturity. Now a mature believer can backslide in all areas of their life. That's certainly true as well. Now he may lose growth in certain areas but not in all areas of the spiritual life. Let me give you an example. TV evangelists who become famous and possibly rich can backslide in finances but still be able to preach the gospel and lead many to the Lord. Now you know, you may know a few that's on the TV or on the radio or in events. There are many of them actually. I'm sure you all know some of these people but give me an example. My brother-in-law Many, many years ago, was a pastor. And finances got into his situation. Spending too much money of his own personal money. And uh, that got him into trouble with his congregation. He was a pastor and he had to resign because of his financial situation. Now, there were other issues as well involved. But after that happened, he couldn't handle the resignation and he became a backslider for many years. Boom. Went back to his old ways, drinking, carousing. But then God got a hold of him. Praise the Lord. Today, guess what? He's back to being a pastor. He got remarried and is following the Lord. So praise God, right? So the fourth is stages of growth. The fourth point here is stages of growth. Just as there are stages of growth in the physical world, there are stages of growth in maturity. It's a growing, grown-up relationship with the Ruach Kodesh. So it's not just getting to be a grown-up, it's continuing in the growing aspect. It has to be growing to be able to constantly flow through all the stages of maturity. For this reason, a new believer must not be placed in leadership positions within the congregation. And the scripture we like to use is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. It's a whole section here talking about overseers or pastors. In verse 6, got it on the screen as well, it says, And not a new convert, lest he become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. 
And so you never have a new convert or a new believer become pastor of a congregation because why? They're going to get what? Conceited. Conceited, which is pride. They're going to get prideful. And then they'll fall into condemnation and, of course, then they will fall. And so maturity cannot be achieved by a sudden or emotional or even a spiritual experience. Those do help you to become mature, but it's in the process, not any one experience. For example, a while back, this is many, many years ago, I saw a video of a, of a church that had put a young boy, not older than six years old, in the beam to preach the gospel to the church. The older audience, they were hooting and they were hollering as that father was preaching. Now, I'm not saying he couldn't preach the gospel. But little boys do not teach or preach from the pulpit to adults. That's just not God's rules. He was obviously not mature enough to be able to do this at six years old. Even at 16, he's not old enough. I thought to myself, though, what a disservice that church did to that boy. Because I'm sure his head grew really big. Too big, he cried. Probably started busting some of the older folks around. And the issue is, was there not a mature man in that congregation to be able to preach? You know what they say, if the, the men are not going to step up, well then the women will. And if the women don't step up, guess what? The children do. And if the children don't, well then, anyway, that church should be closed a long time ago. In any event, when it comes to maturity, we all need to remember that we shall never get there in this lifetime. You're never going to get to the end goal of being completely mature. Okay? Even so, there is always room for growth and maturity. And so the idea is the goal is to be mature, but understand that you're never ever going to get to the end result of being 100% mature the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, get up on the screen. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been known fully. And so, Shaul Paul is preaching to the Corinthians, and he's talking about Yeshua here. He's saying, right now we see in the mirror dimly. Yes, we have the scriptures. We don't know all the scriptures, do we? We don't know all the hidden meanings of the scriptures even. We don't even know all the meanings of all the scriptures. We know in part, but we know enough to have relationship and fellowship with the Lord. Amen? We know enough. But the idea is to continue to read, to continue to study, so that you grow more and more in that knowledge. And then, in the future, when Messiah comes for us, we will know when. Or what? Well, you will know fully. Right? Just as we have been known fully by the Lord. And see, so the idea is our goal is to be completely mature, but we're never going to reach that goal. We're never going to be 100%. But that doesn't mean we don't stop trying, okay? Always have to keep trying. Go to Philippians now, chapter 3. Verse 12 to 14, Shaul says this again to the Philippians, not that I have already obtained it, and he's talking about the resurrection from the dead, but then he adds in here, he says, or have already become perfect. And the word perfect means mature. So remember, this is Shaul towards the end of his life, and he's saying he's not perfect, he's not mature. But, I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Messiah Yeshua. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. So an aspect of our maturity is forget about all the garbage of the past. Some of us have some really bad histories. Of sinful histories, right? Forget about it. Forget about what lies behind. Reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of 
God in Messiah Yeshua. And so the idea here is to get about the past, move forward, continue to press on in the process and the journey of maturity. It's a daily, little bit, understanding at a time, folks. You just don't become mature overnight. There's stages in growth in the Lord. But we shall not reach the goal ultimately until the day of Messiah. That's the rapture. When Messiah comes for us, then we will know fully. I'm looking forward to that day because then our heads can be real big. It'll be allowed. It's a joke. Come on. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. That gives us this promise. It says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it, will complete it, until the day of Messiah Yeshua, or until the rapture happens. And so, God started a good work in us when he saved us, however long ago that was. 20 years ago, 50 years ago, a few months ago. Doesn't matter. He started a good work in us. And He is the one that will complete it. He's going to work with us. He's going to work with us. He will complete it. We need to work with Him to make sure that that is maturity, that we get there. At least what I call getting over the hump. And so our growth and maturity falls on our shoulders to whether we want it or not. God is always there for us and wants us to grow each and every day. And He is ready to help. He's there ready to help. And so the fifth aspect, the spiritual life, the areas of the spiritual life. The spiritual life involves your personality, your home life, your family life, your employment life your public life, and your national life. Has your maturity changed your personality? Has your maturity changed how you treat your family at home? How you are at work? And how you treat others in public? The sixth aspect here, the duration of babyhood. When we are born again, we are considered to be babes, spiritual babes in Messiah. We're immature, but we're on the right road, right? Babyhood, though, need not be long. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, which we're going to study later on tonight, Paul expected the Corinthians to be mature at the time of his writing. There was a period of about four to five years between the founding of the congregation and the letter of writing. And he expected them to be mature at that time. However, the Corinthians were not mature and they were in need of milk, which Shalom called it baby milk. Let me give you an example. My wife and I we were very young in the Lord, but very mature in our age as the Lord was growing us rapidly. We helped plant uh, Bethel Shaddai in Los Angeles. It's a congregation that no longer is there, unfortunately. But we helped plant that congregation. We became leaders as well. We were young in the Lord, though. But we had trouble from older believers of that congregation. They weren't necessarily glad that we were helping to be leaders because of this principle that we were not as mature as they had hoped. For preachers, this problem is called the Timothy complex. Have you ever heard of it before? Yeah, Timothy had a complex. Older believers in his congregation were kind of putting him down and saying, look, you're just too young and the Lord you shouldn't be preaching. But Paul was the one that put Timothy in that position. And even I had that preacher's Timothy complex because I was young in the Lord. I was an assistant pastor helping out. And we had all these older folks, older believers that were looking down on me and my wife. Paul 
encouraged Timothy to continue leading and preaching, even though he was young in the Lord. And some of the congregants were coming against him. And so moving on, the three characteristics of spirituality. Now just remember, I'm giving you a whole general informational context here as we're going to be getting into a lot of specifics as we get on to the next many weeks. The first characteristic of spirituality, spirituality will be evident in the believer. Other believers will see the growth in the believer in at least four different areas. First, the believer will develop a Messiah-like frame of reference. They will begin, of course, to become like the Messiah. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 states this. Paul says, I have been crucified with Messiah, and it is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So as Messiah lives in us and helps us to grow inside, he will begin to show that growth to the world on the outside. Yeshua lives inside of us, well guess what? It's going to break through to the outside. I gave you an example a few weeks ago when I first got saved. In the first month, God was changing me on the inside. I didn't know I was being changed on the outside. I was just reading the scripture like, like Meshuggah and learning as much as I could. My wife and I, we were both going to a congregation five days out of the week, just soaking up everything. And I was going to work. My secretary, after a month, she took me to the side and she said, what happened to you? I told you this story. What did you do? He says, why are you so nice? I was not a good person before I got saved, but God had changed me already. Even within that first month, I became a nice person. She said, what happened to you? She says, you fell in love with somebody. And I said, yes, I did. Jesus is his name. And uh, that blew her away. But God was already working. He was already changing me. I had no clue I was being changed. I didn't know that it was coming out that way. To me, it was just normal. I was just being normal rich. But it wasn't. It was the new rich. Second, the second way that spirituality will be evident in the believer, there will be an increase of knowledge concerning the Word of God. So a believer who does not know the Scriptures cannot be spiritual. It's that simple. You've got to be in the Word. Third, spirituality will be seen in the believer's attitude. It will be characterized, characterized by thanksgiving, unity and love, spirit and purpose, and having a servant heart. As Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. Let's read those scriptures. Paul says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And so you see a change of attitude to become humble. Prior to being saved, we were not humble, folks. We were selfish. But humble is different. Humble is godliness. Amen? So babyhood and carnality are characterized by impatience, divisiveness, disunity, and selfishness. But the spiritual believer is going to be thanks, uh, giving thanks and being humble and thinking of others and being united. The fourth aspect that's evident in the believer their spirituality will be seen in the believer's conduct, their actions, and stem from their new attitude will reveal, their, will reveal their maturity. And so if God is changing our mind and changing our attitude, He's going to change our actions as well. So our actions will show that as well. Second characteristic of spirituality is it will be evident in the believer's home. You all know about the R and Y Messianic believers and the C and E churchgoers. 
You know what those are? The Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur Messianic believers, they only come twice a year to services. The C and E are Christmas and Easter church codes. But they act so godly in these two services, but when they get home, the rest of the year, forget about it. Right? I remember growing up as a kid, we used to call it because we went to church and uh, the C and E crowd would always come on Christmas and Easter, and our congregation, our little church, all of a sudden ballooned up and got filled. You know? And I asked my mom, like, where are these people the rest of the year? They're like, well, they're C and E. They're seeing any church covers, that's it. But the issue is at home they're much different. We don't want to be different. When we're here and then we're at home, we want to be the same person, the same godly person. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33, it shows us that in the spiritual home, the wife will be submitting to the husband. The husband submits to the wife as well. The children submit to their parents. And the husband is the head of the household submitting to Yeshua and needs to take care of all the family needs. A mature believer will be submitting to the Lord and their spouse. The third characteristic of spirituality will be evident in the believer's fellowship. Is the believer attending a congregation and using their spiritual gifts to help that congregation grow unto the Lord? A couple aspects there, right? You're going to congregation, but you're not just receiving, you're also giving. Using your spiritual gifts. The spiritual believer is faithful, and the immature believer is not. Spirituality can now understand the deep things of God. The deep things of God are taught and explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to chapter 3 of verse 4. I have it up on the screen. There are four clarification of four points that we all need to understand. Number one, divine revelation is now given through the written word. Chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians. It's up on the screen, but if you've got your Bibles, we open up. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. So as it is written, right, the non-believers are not going to understand it, but those who love Him, God has prepared His Word for them. So divine revelation is now given through the written word. In the old covenant, certain things were revealed and hidden, but now all things are revealed in the word. So what do we got to do? We got to read it. Got to study it. Meditate over it. And God will then illuminate in your life. That's number two. The Ruach Kodesh now has the illuminating ministry, verse 10 and 11. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God, or the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. So the Ruach Kodesh illuminates the minds of the mature of the deep things of the Lord. We can only understand the Scriptures by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. But you have to read, you've got to study. Work your way to becoming mature, to understand and to know these deep things. The third aspect, the divine wisdom is hidden in the scriptures. Verse 13, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So the divine wisdom and content is understood only as one is able to compare spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. The only spiritual words that you can get are from the scriptures. So all of our spiritual thoughts need to line up with the spiritual words written in the word. God will work and impart his wisdom as we read, study, ponder, meditate on the word. 
So his wisdom is hidden in the scriptures. God's classification of all men, that's the fourth aspect here. God actually classifies all men in these scriptures. Verse uh, 214 through chapter 3, verse 4. The Lord puts all of mankind into four classifications. Look at verse 14. The first is natural man. Let me tell you, none of us want to be natural man. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Natural man is not saved and does not have the Ruach Kodesh. He therefore does not accept the deep things of God or anything from God. He sees this as foolishness. How many times have you shared the gospel with someone and they just come out and say, you know, you're, you're a fool. You believe in God, you're a fool. I've heard that many times over the years. That's natural man. They don't get it, folks. They don't understand the spiritual. They don't understand it at all. Second classification of all mankind is the spiritual man. 215 to 16. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah. The spiritual man is the full mature believer. Verse 15 here says he appraises or discerns all things. That doesn't mean that we are not fooled at times. Certainly we are fooled at times, but we're able to discern all things. This means he does not, we do not have to be running around all the time asking questions of all of our friends concerning life situations in the scriptures. He freely receives from the Ruach Kodesh, understands the deep things of God with his mind, and is able to make application in life. The reason he can do all these things is that he has the mind of Messiah. And this truly shows maturity. The third classification of all men is the babe in Messiah. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Messiah. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able. So the Corinthians were still babes in Messiah. They were immature believers. They believed in Yeshua, and yet they were living a life that was immature. That means they were making a whole lot of bad mistakes. Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians to correct all the problems. And it wasn't just a few in that congregation, unfortunately. It was a whole lot of them. Isn't it great to be the baby of the family? Anybody here the baby of the family? Everyone treats you differently, and you usually become very dependent on others. Not so in the family of God. Babes are tolerated for a while, but eventually they need to do up. Well. Yeah, they need to grow up, be mature. The baby Messiah is an immature believer who is still weak in the Lord of God. The positive side is that they're growing. They're growing. It describes the brand new believer who's still fleshly like the world, but just started to grow in the Lord. They understand the milk of the word, but they do not understand the meat of the word. The deeper things of God from the word. And then the fourth characteristic or classification of all men is the carnal man. Chapter 3, verse 3 through 4. For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? So, the baby Messiah is compared to the carnal believer here. The carnal man is one who can understand the deeper things of God, but chooses not to. He would rather be fleshly, fallen back away from God, revealing his own jealousy and strife-causing spirit even in congregations. He cannot get along with other believers, and especially mature believers. They have a very difficult time getting along with them. 
His lifestyle is just like the natural man, except for the fact that he was saved. So this person is saved, and they're choosing not to become mature. They're falling back and choosing to be fleshly and be worldly. And so now the question remains for all of us, which category are you? Which category do you want to be in? And then, what are you doing about it? Because the Lord is right here waiting for you in your decisions. And finally, we'll cover the contrast between babyhood and carnality and maturity. Over our next set of scriptures, they contrast the difference between babyhood, immature believer, the carnal believer who is immature but had the time to mature, and the spiritual believer who is mature in the Lord. Every believer goes through babyhood, but the problem is many stay in that stage instead of moving upward to the great calling the Lord has for all of us, and that is maturity. So let's take a look at the dilemma. It's found in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 to 14. There are four points to consider. Verse 11, the first point, the difference in understanding. Concerning him, we have much to say, and the writer here is talking about Melchizedek. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now the spiritual believer will be able to understand the hard teachings of the scriptures. In verse 11 it's stated as hard to explain. Paul called these the deep things of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10. Peter, Peter even said in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and 16, I'm going to put that up on the scripture there, I mean on the screen, that Paul's writings were hard to understand even for the apostles and the elders. You have that up there? It's uh, 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. And then you're going to have to go back to Hebrews chapter 5, okay? Verse 15 and 16. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. So who gave Paul's wisdom to him? God did. Yeshua did, right? as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Now Peter is the apostle, right? He's one of the apostles in Jerusalem, and he's saying Paul's writings are hard to understand. So is it going to be tough for us to understand? Yes. Certainly. But, do we have the royal Kodesh? Yes. And is he our teacher? Yes. Which the untaught and unstable distort as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. And so the spiritual believer is able to handle the hard teachings, the deep things of God, but even though they're hard to understand through prayer and study, they and we can know the truth through the power of Ruff's teaching. However, the baby believer and the carnal believer had become dull of hearing. They hear the scriptures and the teaching, but just don't understand it enough to put it into practice. The difference between these two, though, is that the carnal believer is not really trying. They may be going through the motions, but they want to be fleshly. The baby believer is trying, and they're growing, and they're eventually going to get there. It just takes some time. It's what I call getting over the hump. The baby believer keeps on trying, keeps on studying, keeps on moving, and one day, they get over that hump, they get to the maturity level. And then the, then the issue from then on is to stay there. So they will graduate to maturity knowing all that is required and will endeavor to continue on the road to grow even more. The best example for understanding here is found in Hebrews chapter 5, concerned with Melchizedek. Now, the writer of Hebrews, he compares the Melchizedekian priesthood with the Levitical priesthood, and it can be a very hard understanding. The mature believer will understand the differences, but the immature will not be able to. Number two, the difference in position. That's verse 12 of chapter 5, so go back to that, please. 
For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need what? Milk and not solid food. So the difference in position here, the spiritual believer is the one who should be teaching. They've had enough time in the Lord and the Scriptures where they are now able to teach others. The baby or carnal believer is still in need of being taught the Scriptures. They do not understand the hard sayings of the Bible. The carnal especially needs to relearn the elementary principles to drink the milk again and not eat the solid food. The immature are also in need of teachers. For example, many of us like to watch the TV preachers and think this helps us to grow. Well, yes, it can help you grow a little bit if all you do is watch and listen. But if you're watching and listening and going through the scriptures after you listen and study those scriptures, then you can grow much more. The point here is we need to get into the scriptures ourselves, study, meditate, ask the Lord questions. And the third is the state of babyhood and carnality. Verse 13, chapter 5. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And so we have the state of babyhood and carnality. Both will partake of only the milk of the word. Both that are not accustomed to the word of righteousness. This involves discernment of the word and application to life. Both of these groups are having issues with this. Uh, the baby, though, is on the positive side as they're growing and reading the scriptures, but the carnal have reverted back to being babes by choice. They choose not to proceed with becoming mature. This is why I tell new believers to read the scriptures like a book. From the beginning, Genesis, all the way through the book of Revelation, just read it like you're reading a book. Write down your thoughts and questions concerning the scriptures as you go through it because you're not going to understand them all. So write your questions down. And then the second time you read through the Bible, guess what? You're going to know all the answers to all the questions you wrote down. And you'll look back and say, how come I didn't know that? That's exactly what happened to me the second time I went to the scriptures. I knew all the answers to my questions. But then again, I was instructed back then to write down new questions. Because now I had gotten to a new level of growth. I knew all the answers of my old questions, but now I had new questions. You keep doing that year after year, and guess what? You're going to know all the answers to those old questions. I did that for many, many years. And this is the Bible I did it in. This Bible is 30 years old, folks. And there's a whole lot of questions and answers and a whole lot of writing in them, and I still have much more to do. So the point is, we need to get into the Scriptures ourselves, study, meditate, ask the Lord the questions, and continue to do it for the rest of our lives. The fourth aspect here, the state of maturity. So we covered babyhood and carnality, but in verse 14 of chapter 5, it's the state of maturity. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. The spiritual believer eats the solid food of the Word, digests it, and uses it in their lives. And the word here is practice. They read, study, digest the Word so that they can apply it to their lives. They need to practice. You practice the applications, meaning you test them out in life, and then you discern what is good, and you discern what is evil. Keep the good, discard the evil, get it out. And then they grow and mature. It's a process, and a slow process. It can be a fast process as well. It just depends on how much you're reading and yes, there is a stage that the babes reach to maturity. But we all must remember that we need to continue to practice to stay mature and even grow stronger. If we falter, we could regress to become babes or become carnal once again. 
So tonight we discuss the spiritual life. The three factors important to the spiritual life. The key concept of maturity in the spiritual life. The six ramifications of the spiritual life. The three characteristics of the spiritual life. Understanding the deep things of God and the Word. And contrasting the four categories of mankind and understanding their differences. The whole point of this teaching is to know where we all stand before the Lord right now. Are we mature or are we immature? Are we babes in Messiah or are we carnal Christians? Or do we even need to be saved? Are we growing every single day of our lives or are we stagnant in our growth? Have we fallen back to our carnal position? Are we moving forward in our babyhood to maturity? By the end of this series, everyone who hears these messages should be moved on to maturity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are mighty, wonderful, and awesome. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We ask, Lord, that you touch all of our hearts. Everybody's in a different position of maturity levels, of babyhood or carnality, Lord, but help us all to move to maturity. We all need to be flowing in that calling that you've called us to because you want us to be mature. <coughs> this is the way that the body of Messiah gets to be sharing around the world. If we're teaching and sharing the good news to others and helping others to grow and to get strong in you and the power of your might, Lord, well then that power moves on around the world and the gospel continues to move around the world. And so Lord, help this little congregation and help these a little amount of people that listen to these messages on our YouTube channel, Lord, to be mature. Help us to grow into that maturity, to be mature, to stay mature, to grow in that maturity as well each and every day of our lives. We love you, thank you, and praise you. Look forward to what you're going to be doing in our lives, Lord, and help us to make those decisions so that we will glorify and magnify and sanctify your name in our lives. In the mighty name of Yeshua we pray. Amen.